nothing good ever lasts forever. It pains me to say, but the final days of the Roman Republic grow ever nearer. For you see, there is a spectre haunting Rome. The spectre of communism. Well, communism, barbarity, plebery, many things to cover today. But before we get to it, we've got to return to those Greek wars that I skipped last time. So we're going back to the Second Punic War, our focus being the Greek kingdom of Macedonia, led by Philip V. He had allied himself with Carthage in the war, but was held back to a stalemate, which is why I didn't bother to mention him before. He did begin to stir up some trouble after he saw Rome civilize some of his neighbors though. After attacking them, he was quickly defeated and pushed back, thus freeing the southern Greeks from his rule. Not that they were grateful, oh far from it. Sparta immediately revolted, only to be easily crushed. Oh, what was that? They were the best warriors of the Greek world? <laughs> well, that's kind of pathetic. And here I thought that Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire was the hot shit. I mean, just look at his empire. Look at those fucking borders. <laughs> It is no surprise to me why Hannibal chose to join his court after he lost at Zama, spending his remaining days convincing Antiochus to attack Rome, to liberate Greece. Those are some huge air quotes there. Antiochus was fucked twice in battle, once by LARPing as Leonidas in Thermopylae so hard that he lost the exact same way, and then by getting completely annihilated at Magnesia, by a Roman army half of his own size no less, all while Hannibal was losing twice at sea, by the joint efforts of Scipio Africanus and his brother Scipio Asiaticus. Utterly defeated, Antiochus fled east losing Asia Minor to Rome's allies. You would think it would be enough, but then Macedon chimped out again, almost like they wanted to be balkanized into four vassal states. Not that it was enough to pacify the region. Oh no, it took Metellus Macedonicus to achieve that, defeating and annexing Macedon once and for all. Some cities like Corinth tried to rebel after that, but they were all set ablaze for their trouble. Good riddance. Alright, back to addressing the Red Menace. As you know, whenever Rome conquered some barbarian rebel, they had the good sense to enslave and put them to work in their farms. This generated immense wealth to the patrician elite, making the plebeian masses super duper jelly, among them Tiberius and Gaius Gracchi, the grandsons of Scipio Africanus, if you can believe it. So what went wrong? Well, their father was a pleb, consul or not, that explains it. But how did it happen? Tiberius showed promise at first, fighting beside Scipio Emilianus in Carthage and all, but once he was sent to serve in Hispania, he partook in a great defeat, personally signing a humiliating treaty for Rome to return home alive. His cowardice was quickly pointed out by the patricians, further fueling his resentment towards them, thus further leading him to the clutches of socialist ideology, getting elected as tribune of the plebs and proposing several socialist laws. Thankfully, they were all vetoed by a more enlightened tribune, whom he quickly had disposed of and harassed by his thugs. And when the king of Pergamon willed Rome to inherit his kingdom after his death, Tiberius had the gall to demand its lands to be given for free to the proletariat. For free, fucking commie. And it only got worse from here, as on the next year, while overseeing the voting process, Tiberius heard a fake rumor involving his assassination. Now scared for his life, Tiberius rose to the crowd, demanding them to give him a crown, so that, as king, he could crush the Roman Republic and bring forth the communist utopia. When the Senate heard of this treacherous shit, they immediately marched out with their weapons, ganging up on Tiberius and clubbing that filthy communist to death, later on throwing his corpse to the Tiber River along with his thugs. They later did the same with his brother Gaius, whom also fell for the communist meme. I only feel sorry for Tiberianus on this one though, he didn't deserve that. But say, now that the socialists are dead, let's talk about borders. As it was around this time the Rome struck a deal with Massalia to create the Roman province of Trasompine Gaul, connecting Italy with Hispania by a road through Narbonne. Quite convenient really, given how he was rebelling at the time. But don't worry, it was quickly pacified by Scipio Emilianus himself, together with his subordinate, Tiberius Gracchi, you know, back when he was still alive. <laughs> as well as the Numidian Jugurtha and Gaius Marius. Yeah, some more about this too. After that, Jugurtha returned to Numidia, overthrowing his relatives in power and bribing all consuls that came to punish him. To settle this, the Senate sent Metellus, the nephew of Macedonicus, to Numidia, accompanied by Gaius Marius, who was basically as good as a pleb could hope to become. Courageous, pragmatic, somewhat educated, reminds me of Servius Tullius. Being too much of a bitch to face Metellus and Marius face to face, Jugurtha started employing every guerrilla trick in the book to delay defeat. So much so that Midas had the time to return Rome, get elected consul, and take over command of the war, bringing with him his subordinate Lucius Sulla. And gods, I love this guy. He soon proved himself capable by persuading Bacchus, the king of Mauritania, to betray Jugurtha, giving him to Sulla, whom then gave him to Marius, who then took all the credit for it. Yep, 
Sulla and Myrus became bitter rivals after that, likely on top of their factional differences. These are the good guys, by the way, if you couldn't figure out by the name. But you know what? Forget all that. For neither the minions nor plebs can compare to the threat that's about to come. An enemy so evil, full of malevolence and hatred, that not only do they wish to spread chaos, but to destroy existence itself. The greatest enemies of mankind, and worst barbarian race of all. Germans. Two of their tribes, the Kimbri and the Teutones, had migrated south from the lands of eternal chaos, destroying everything in their path until they neared Italy. Marius could tell that this was no ordinary foe, and so issued the Marian reforms, creating the Roman legion of popular imagination. There were no more Hastati, Principes or Triari, just legionaries, and two assistants for every eight of them, which made up the Contubernium, led by a Decanus. Ten of those made a sentry, led by a centurion. Six of those made up a cohort, led by an experienced centurion. And nine of those, plus a special first cohort led by the Primus Pilus, together made up the Roman Legion. There was some cavalry, but who gives a shit about them? The Legion was led by a legate, an elected senator, advised by his useless military tribunes, with the supplies and constructions led by the camp prefect. Overall, the reforms allowed any poor fact to enlist, made the generals responsible for their payment, and transformed the legions into stronger, faster, Faster, cheaper, professional soldiers, with no downsides at all. Nope. It was with this army that both Marius and Sulla confronted the germs, annihilating both the Kimbri and the Teutonic tribes, despite being heavily outnumbered. But Marius would remain forever scarred, as the horrors he experienced by facing the germs in battle could never be remedied, with Sulla sharing the sentiment. But at least, Rome had been saved from a Germanic sack, for now. And if it all sounded too easy for you, that won't be the last time we hear from those germs. <laughs> I wish. I really do. Anyway, let's talk about that civil war that's going on in Italy right now. You know, the social war, when the Italians decided to collectively revolt, again, founding a new capital, printing coins that mocked Rome, getting absolutely trashed by Sulla in Ascolum and Nola, and, uh, well, I guess that's that. Sulla really hated Samnites, by the way. Well, who doesn't? As the war neared its end, Rome offered citizenship to those who surrendered, as a sign of goodwill. Let's see how long it would take for the Samnites to chimp out again. Spoiler warning, not even five minutes. Now a famous war hero, Sulla would get himself elected as consul, which happened to coincide with yet another Greek king starting shit in the east. So let's get back to that particular rabbit hole again. So we have this kingdom called Pontus, right? It was ruled by a guy named Mithridates, a vicious, vicious Greekoid. He began both plotting and directly fighting against all of his neighbors, especially Rome's client states like Bithynia. Rome tried to raise some local auxiliaries to stop him, but they were too weak. And after having taken control of all of Asia Minor, and I swear I'm not exaggerating, Mithridates ordered the genocide of every Roman man, woman and child in Asia. 100,000 Roman colonists were mercilessly killed and sacrificed to Moloch, in the most despicable act ever committed by a Greek since the sack of Troy. Needless to say that Sulla was horrified when he learned of this, preparing his legions for a campaign to avenge the fallen. But this is where Marius finally goes truly mad. He was quite old by then, you see, and combined with his PTSD and plebeian nature, he went full senile. Demanding, demanding that the Senate transfer Sulla's army leadership to him, which they actually did. Why? Well, this is the kind of shit you get when you allow plebs to have political rights. I fucking told you, I, I fucking did. And honestly, it was too much for Sulla to take. Between being betrayed by an increasingly plebeian dominated Senate and the sheer evil of both Greeks and germs, Sulla forced himself to swallow that bitter red pill. The truth was that the Jews were behind everything. Oh, oh no, wait, wrong red pill. I, ah, yes, here. Alright, so the truth was that the Republic would soon fall if things kept going the way they were. With this in mind, Sulla, the madman, did the unthinkable, ordering his legions to march to Rome, for he would personally save the Republic by force. Marius might have become senile by then, but he wasn't stupid, fleeing to Africa just before Sulla could arrive. He chose to be lenient, quickly lecturing the Senate, and after having restored order, Sulla returned to his invasion plans, crossing the sea and proceeding to crush Mithridates' armies twice in the battles of Chaeronea and Archimedes, and then setting Athens ablaze after that. Because fuck Greeks, seriously man. With his armies destroyed, Mithridates surrendered, renouncing all of his conquests in Asia. It was only to buy time though, once a barbarian, always a barbarian. But once a pleb, always a pleb too. 
for Marius used this time to raise his own legions on Africa, marching on Rome and killing every Optimates he could find, forcing the Senate to elect Cena and himself consuls, for the seventh time. Only for him to die, like, three weeks later. So much for that. Cena would later be killed by his troops to try and curry favor with Sulla, which just didn't work. He was too pissed for that. What happens later is just hilarious. The Senate appointed a total of four consuls to try and stop Sulla. The first was Asiaticus, his son, whose army defected him. The second was Nurbanus, whom only raised recruits, against Sulla's veteran armies. Very shitty plan. And the last two were Carbo and Marius's son, whom Sulla would defeat easily with the help from his two supporters, Pompey and Crassus. Ah oh man, the next episode is gonna be so fucking fun to edit. To top it all off, 20,000 Samnites showed up as a final opposition to Sulla, whom he happily had all killed. Kind of pointless, really. Appointing himself dictator for life, Sulla issued the prescriptions, putting bounties on the heads of every filthy popularis he took a dislike to, thus purging the Senate, Rome and abroad of their ilk, later on passing a series of laws to prevent any future wannabe Mariuses from harming the Republic. And finally, after hearing that Mithridates was starting shit once again, he had his general in the field sue for peace after a quick skirmish, just to let that Greek court fuck off to the east and be somebody else's problem. Now finished with his duties, Sulla resigned his lifelong dictator dictatorship after just one year, serving as consul for a little bit, and then retiring to his small farm with his wife. And his Greek twink sex slave, of course, whom he fucked every single day and night of his retirement. Because if he was too old to fuck Greeks on the battlefield, he would do it in his bed. For there is nothing manlier than asserting your authority over a weaker man's ass while your wife cooks food for you. And that's all for today. A series of wars and internal conflicts that brought the Republic to the brink, only to be saved by the righteous hand of conservative patrician Optimates Justice. And well, I'm lying. There is one more scene I should return to. It was during the funeral of Gaius Marius's wife, Julia, as her nephew rose up from the crowd and had this to say about her. The family of my aunt Julia is descended by her mother from the kings and on her father's side is akin to the immortal gods. For the Marquis Rages go back to Ancus Marcius and the Julie, the family of which ours is a branch, to Venus. Our stock, therefore, has at once the sanctity of kings, whose power is supreme among mortal men and the claim to reverence which attaches to the gods who hold sway over kings themselves.